The sky was filled with the roar of hundreds of airplanes of the Imperial Japanese Navy, the largest and most modern Navy in the world. All lay quiet in the airfield in the harbor below. The commander checked his watch, 7.49 a.m. He radioed back to the carrier the code words, Torah, 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 that meant tiger, tiger, tiger. The surprise was complete for the Japanese. Everything had pivoted on that moment, and America would never be the same again. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. We've all heard the tragic story of Pearl Harbor. In fact, this week is the 80th anniversary of that dark day that forever broke the peaceful paradise of Hawaii and became the day of infamy. When we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, America's military went from a small army. In fact, it was the 17th world power behind Portugal to being the number one leading superpower and defender of freedom for the next 80 years. But for now, this sneak attack put us right into the thick of a world war that would last for the next four years. In the middle of this tragedy, one man played a key role, Mitsuo Fushida. I want to tell you the story and the world events that led this man to Christ. The people God used to break through his cold warrior heart make this unforgettable. These are stories from ice to fire, from death to life, transforming revivals. Captain Fushida stayed above Pearl Harbor, Hawaii from the first wave of attack to the second. And he made notes of the progress of the attack. He drew a map of the battle damage. In fact, there's a copy of the map right here. He gave this map personally to the Japanese Emperor Hirohito. During the attack, his plane was hit 21 times by anti-aircraft fire. This was the first of many times his life was spared, and it was spared for a purpose. Fushida became a national hero, training 500 men and leading the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Fushida's success led him to meet the Emperor of Japan, the greatest honor of all for a Japanese warrior. Remember, the Emperor was considered a living god. It was the year of the tiger, 1902, when Mitsuo Fushida was born. He was raised on Japanese nationalism, and his memoirs say, what I always heard was, your enemy is the United States. Honor and Japan were priorities in his life, and it showed. He attended the Japanese Naval Academy and trained to be a carrier pilot. Fushida's ultimate achievement was when he led the 360 planes of the Imperial Japanese Navy Task Force, spearheading the surprise attack operation on Hawaii. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese Admiral Yamamoto famously said, I fear all we have done is awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. Well, that resolve first came in the form of a daring and an ingenious attack plan. The president wanted a quick strike that would make difference and rally the American people. The Pentagon desperately sorted through plan after plan. Japan had surrounded herself and captured territory, all protected by her massive Navy. The emperor promised the Japanese people in the samurai tradition that they were invincible and nothing could touch their homeland. And in fact, no American airplane had the range to even reach Japan. There just wasn't a base close enough 
to launch an attack from. Now you may have heard of 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, this book. It was made into a movie during World War II. In fact, it was the most historically accurate war movie ever made. That shows how amazing this story was. Even Hollywood felt it didn't need any added drama. The idea was to take medium army bombers on a Navy carrier and sneak up on Japan close enough to launch the bombers. The president loved this idea, but who could pull it off? Well, only one man in America, a rough and wild Alaskan frontiersman who was the best pilot of all time. This guy, Jimmy Doolittle. 16 B-25s, twin-motored army bombers, lashed to the Hornet's flight deck. The dramatic saga of a combined Army-Navy mission that brought panic to Japan and stirred the world for its brilliance and daring. This is one of those moments in history where everything was riding on just a few brave men. Could things get worse? Well, yes. The weather turned against them. The stormy seas were pitching the Hornet up and down 30 feet. Not only had no one ever flown a loaded bomber off a carrier, the Raiders were about to attempt it in weather so bad, they normally wouldn't even fly that off a normal runway. But Doolittle gave the order, gentlemen, man your planes. Doolittle wouldn't give an order he wouldn't do. He was piloting airplane number one. With only 400 feet to roll, if he made it, the others could too. As he began his roll, the ship was actually pointed down at the water as the ship pitched and rolled, but one by one, each plane made it off the carrier and headed for each of their four target cities in Japan. Because they launched early, it was noonday, and there was nothing to hide them from the anti-aircraft fire or Japanese fighters. However, miraculously, they all made it to their targets and dropped their bombs. Doolittle himself chose to target Tokyo and in sight, of the Japanese Imperial Palace, he pulled up to bombing altitude and released his bombs on military targets. While this may have seemed like a small victory strategically, the psychological effects were huge. It delivered such a blow to the Japanese people, it broke the feeling of invincibility and changed the course of the war. With only 80 men, here's a newspaper of the event. In 16 planes, Doolittle and his brave raiders changed history. The president awarded Jimmy Doolittle the Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry. After bombing Japan, Doolittle's men knew they didn't have enough fuel to make it safely to bases in China, and they were expecting to bail out in the China Sea. But miraculously, they all got a tailwind that carried them into China. There was no meteorological reason for winds to come from that direction. The men said it was like God's hand pushing them to safety. They all crash landed or bailed out over China and had to find friendly Chinese peasants who would help them escape the Japanese. Of the 80 Doolittle Raiders, three died in action. Eight were captured by the Japanese. Of the eight captured, three were executed and one died of starvation. It was deemed one of the most daring aerial missions in American history. Now I told you about the Doolittle Raid for one reason. I want to tell you about one of the Raiders in particular. You're going to like how all this fits together. How when God's making a plan, the unexpected becomes amazing. And especially how God made all things work together for this man and his Japanese enemy. Meet Jacob DeShazer. We call him Jake. He was a Doolittle Raider and four months earlier, he had been working KP duty when he heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. This made him so mad, he threw his potato against the wall and vowed right then to get revenge on the Japanese. Corporal DeShazer was the rebellious son of a Church of God minister. He was the bombardier in number 16, which was the last bomber plane to launch off the USS Hornet. His plane dropped incendiary bombs on an oil installation and a factory in Nagoya. After the raid, the five crewmen 
bailed out over Japanese occupied territory in China and were captured by the Japanese. In a Japanese trial, the men were condemned as war criminals. Emperor Hirohito personally commuted their sentences and Jake DeShazer and the other crewmen were given life imprisonment. This included continued starvation, beatings, torture, and spending much of their time in solitary confinement. It's difficult to imagine the 40 months of mental torture this brave American endured behind bars. When one of the Doolittle Raiders died of starvation, Jake cursed. Every Japanese should be wiped off the face of the earth, all of them. Yet word went through the Japanese guards not to have another raider die as they hoped to use them as bartering tokens. Then the uh, Japanese prison officials changed their treatment and we asked them for the Bible and we begged them to give us something to read because we were sitting in solitary confinement and uh, we were pretty discouraged. But um, I got that Bible finally and I read the Bible clear through. I had it for three weeks and uh, I thought now is a good chance to find out who Jesus really is and why the Christians think so much of him. I started writing it at the first and I found out that um, there's prophecy about Jesus way back when Moses was on earth. Moses said the Lord himself will come. He was talking about Jesus. And then Isaiah and all the prophets had the same idea. Jesus is coming. And then in the New Testament, it said he was in the world and the world was made by him. That's who Jesus is. He's the creator. And they knew he was coming and he was here and nearly 2000 years ago. Oh, that made a tremendous difference in my life when I realized who Jesus is. He's God Almighty. And when I found that out, I began to pray to him. And about uh, uh, 10 days after I started to pray, I was sitting on my stool, and it was 8th of June, 1944. And my Bible, I had been reading this Bible, but I laid it down on the floor. I looked down there, and it said in Romans 10:9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Well, you know, I knew those conditions were met in my life. Jake's life was about to take a new path when he was given a Bible. Now remember, he was in solitary confinement. So he's got a welcome break from the monotony and the misery. Then he saw Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was like a light came on in his spirit and it got personal really fast. He asked the Lord to forgive him and come into his heart. He also forgave his Japanese captors. His memoirs say the hatred in his heart began to melt. He wrote, Lord, I, I, I want to follow you in the right ways. You know, be on the team all the way. Make a stand. Be baptized. Just like it says in he looked up as a gust of wind blew a spray of water through the window slot 12 feet above him. Jake grinned and nodded and started a ritual of using his toes and fingers to climb the wall of his five by five cell. At the very top, he put his smiling face into the wind. He was promptly doused in a spray of freezing rainwater. What a baptism, huh? He said, whoa, that's cold. He shook his face with joy. I sure won't forget this day ever. He realized his hatred had pushed the guards away, but when the Lord took away hatred and anger, his kindness also brought out his kindness in his guards. One even gave him a sweet potato. From feeling so completely alone in his prison cell, his new relationship with the Lord changed everything. Instead of only getting news through the walls using Morse code over the pipes, with the Lord, he had his own new center and guide. After the Lord's practical help got to Shazar, moved over to three meals a day with vitamins, he gratefully asked God, what would you like me praying for? He was directed to pray for peace and to pray without stopping. Finally, on August 8th, 1945, he got up onto his aching knees and asked for God to put a desire for peace in the hearts of the Japanese leaders and for the allies to treat the Japanese with mercy after the war. The 10th of August, 1945, a wonderful 
thing happened because the uh, Lord told me to pray right at that time, yeah, early in the morning. I prayed till 2.30 in the afternoon, according to the clock in the, in the prison. At 2.30, just clear as anything, God spoke to me and He said, you don't need to pray more, the victory's won. And uh, I just really, I really believe to this day I was cooperating. God wants us to pray. And uh, we can cooperate with God by praying and being in touch with Him. And you know, it was on the 15th when the radios and newspapers came out in America and said the war's over, Japan surrenders. But I was five days ahead of them. <laughs> and all I had was uh, just be in contact with God. And I said, Jake, what was the matter? And he said, Bobby, I was praying this morning and the war is going to be over today. He said it was revealed to me. Now let me put this in context. At the exact time the airplane was taking off to drop the last atomic bomb, God woke Jake up to pray for Japan, to end the war and to pray for peace. In his memoirs, he wrote, I was praying this morning and the war is going to be over today. It was revealed to me. It's over. And here's a newspaper of that event. Let me show you. This is great. Peace. Within hours that same day, Japan would experience what no other nation in wartime ever had. By the time he was rescued, he knew he would return to Japan to spread the word of salvation to the Japanese. Now stick with me. More on Jacob's story later. On September 2nd, 1945, General MacArthur and the American fleet sailed into the Tokyo Harbor. On board the deck of the battleship Missouri, the Japanese representative signed the official instrument of surrender and World War II officially ended. Fushida was devastated. He was religiously trained throughout his life that dying in battle was honorable and surrender was unacceptable. That's why Japanese pilots did kamikaze suicide runs, sending their planes into American ships. Yet now Japan had surrendered to America. Everything he had worked for was gone. As he worked his land all alone, his worldview of everything he had worked for and had believed in came crashing down around him. It was the first time he was not in the noise and order of the life of a warrior but the Bushido code he had lived and expected to die by. In this silence, he began to hear that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. He started noticing God through his creation, glorious sunrises, the order and beauty of playful birds, seeing crops he planted grow. He began to realize there was a creator God that he didn't know. He began to thirst after the truth. And then, to make matters worse, he was called by General MacArthur to Tokyo to testify against his countrymen before the War Crimes Tribunal. This is actual footage of him at the trial. He hated being forced to testify. How could he betray his brothers when no doubt the Americans had done worse? He heard the list. The Japanese killed at least 250,000 civilians, enslaved millions to do forced labor, killed thousands in medical experiments, and with chemical and biological weapons, tens of thousands died in Japanese POW camps. Then there was the worst, proof they cannibalized prisoners of war. His religious worldview simply didn't understand what was meant by war crimes. War was war, right? He had fought for and served his country. What did he have to answer for? Bad things happened during war. In fact, even he had lost everything because of the war. He was determined to find evidence that America had been equally brutal to their Japanese prisoners. Fushida heard that Japanese prisoners of war were being repatriated off ships in Tokyo Bay. So he sought out these returning soldiers that had been held captive by the Americans. Surely they would have many bad things to say about their captors. Instead of the torture this Japanese thought was normal, he learned that they were treated kindly and according to the Geneva Convention. 
He even found some of his friends he thought were killed at the Battle of Midway. They told him about an American woman, Peggy Cavell, who worked at the hospital where she prayed for the Japanese prisoners. She was kind to them, gracious, and even understanding. When she was asked why she helped them, she replied, because the Japanese army killed my parents, the Holy Spirit has washed away my hatred and has replaced it with love. Peggy learned when her parents were told they would be executed, they had asked for a time to pray, not for themselves, but for their captors. Fushida had a lot to think about. In his memoirs, Fushida said he was deeply moved and felt tears coming down his cheek. He tried to put in context how Peggy's parents' executions would have been regarded in Japan. God was not done with Fushida yet. He was on his way to testify at the war crimes trials when he got off the train in Tokyo. A man was handing out these little books about the story of Jacob de Shazer. This is Jacob de Shazer's tract that was passed out everywhere. The vertical Japanese text says here, I was a prisoner of Japan. When Fushida was handed a book, he read how Jacob's life was changed while he was reading the Bible. So he wanted to find out more. So he immediately purchased a small Japanese New Testament like this one right here. And it was while reading Luke 23 that God broke through to his heart. And well, let's listen to his own words what happened next. And this inspired me, you know, yes. to get a Bible thing. I never <laughs> read the Bible. At that time, I was 47 years old. And during my 47 years, I had never heard the name of Jesus, you know. I was really lost, lost one. Right. But his story inspired me to get the Bible. And I bought a copy of the Bible, and I too read it to pages eagerly every day. One day, I was reading the Bible. I came to the Gospel of Luke, 2334. Jesus was hanging on the cross, nailed to the cross, you know. And he prayed, you know, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right at that moment, he came into my heart. You know, so. <laughs> I clearly understood what Jesus had done on the cross. He died for me too. Yes. Right away, I accepted him my personal savior, you know. Then he transformed me, you know. I was a sinner, but he friends of me, you know. Yes. And I accepted him as my personal savior. Since then, I dedicated the balance of my life to serve them to serve for him, you know. This is my story, how this typical Japanese military officer became a Christian. But you know, it is no secret what God can do. Amen. <laughs> it touches me that he immediately wrote in the space of DeShazer's memoirs of conversion, now I receive the only Son of God, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. Date of this contract, February 26th, 1950. The man who went through the smoke and death of war lived his post-war days as an ardent Christian, exhorting people to come to Jesus. With the emperor of Japan reneging his status as a living God, Japan had a religious vacuum. General Douglas MacArthur called for churches in the United States to send missionaries to Japan. Ever heard of Cadbury chocolates? they helped send 11 million Bibles to Japan. Now missionary Jacob de Shazar returned to Japan. He would lead hundreds to the Lord sharing his testimony. He and his wife Florence would plant 23 churches in Japan. One Japanese reporter asked Jake, 
Why are you returning to a country where the people held you prisoner and treated you badly? He responded, God has called me to tell the Japanese people about Jesus. Why do we need Jesus now? Someone else asked. Jake smiled. That's an easy one to answer. I know that the Japanese are very educated people, but I don't think they know what happened 2,000 years ago, so I'm going to bring them up to date. DeShazer had completed 40 days of fasting when Mitsuo Fushida, now a Christian, came to his door. He got Fushida baptized. Mitsuo Fushida would minister stateside with Rex Humbard and Billy Graham. Fushida said, I know you long for peace, personal peace, as well as world peace. And real peace comes only through Jesus Christ. Fushida wrote, I now work at striking the death blow to the basic hatred which infests the human. And that hatred cannot be uprooted without assistance from Jesus Christ. He is the Holy One, the only one who is powerful enough to change my life and inspire it with His Word. All right, I want us to recap this amazing story of what happened because there's so many details in here of how God moved in every one of their lives. I mean, what are the odds of these people all being connected by one verse in Luke 23? All right, remember we start off here with Fushida, Japanese war hero. I bombed Pearl Harbor. He was involved. He was a Japanese war hero, but he had a life without purpose after the war. Over here, Peggy Cavell, her parents were actually missionaries in Manila when the Japanese took over. They cut their heads off. She could have been bitter, but yet she was, she elected to stand on Luke 23 and forgive the Japanese people. Then we have our young American flyer over here, Jake, and Jake is in, a, he's in prison. He was one of Doolittle's raiders. He gets captured by the prisoner. He's captured and imprisoned by the Japanese. And in the middle of his prison cell with no one around him, he gets saved and has a miraculous conversion to Christ. Now the war ends. What happens? We have Fushida who doesn't have anywhere to go. He's without purpose. He hears about this story. He hears about this story. And what happens? He gets saved, becomes a missionary, goes to America. Jake comes back over here to Japan and becomes a missionary to Japan. And you may remember, we saw Jake over here. He's uh, a Fushida is with uh, Billy Graham and we see him all over uh, the, the country as he was traveling and seeing people saved with Billy Graham and Rex Humbar. So listen, when you see this story, I, you know, I want you to be encouraged. Just like when Brother Copeland called me a few days ago and said, I want you to retell this story because it's such an amazing story of how somebody can be the one, you never know who's watching. You never know how your story will affect someone else. So thank you for watching today. Remember this, always, always remember, there's always an opportunity to be the one for Christ and be the revival in someone's life. We'll see you next time.